Hello, hello. Welcome and welcome back to the United Mates Football Podcast. As ever, I am joined by my co-host Joe, and we are both delighted to be in the company, albeit virtually, of someone whose distinguished career in the Premier League and Football League lasted for nearly 20 years, during which this exciting left winger also managed to represent England at the senior level. Since then, he's worked in coaching at the club where he first made a name for himself as a player, and currently works as a presenter for Sky Sports, where you probably watched him watching football and reacting to it on the infamous Gillette Soccer Saturday show. He's also an ambassador for the Pitch DMM app, which has created a new community for passionate football fans to speak their mind and have their feelings shared with fellow fans, as well as players and coaches at the clubs themselves. We welcome John Salako to the United Mates Football Podcast. John, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. Thanks very much for having me on. Pleasure to be with you guys. Cheers. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, John. It's a pleasure to speak to you today. Um, and we always start our interviews with a quick little icebreaker. So we've had a little look at your Twitter profile and we can see you're a big fan of the Netflix program, The Queen's Gambit. Um, now, this is clearly a program where chess takes centre stage. So what we want to know is, what is your favourite board game? Board game? Yeah. Oh, do you know what? My absolute favourite, and it's taken me through lockdown, it's absolutely brilliant, Scrabble. Scrabble is just so, such a brilliant game. And do you know what? I, I just love the fact that you can play it quickly, you can play it slowly. It, it just always is different. You know, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, sometimes it goes your way, sometimes it doesn't. And the one I discovered was Othello, which is quicker and fun. I don't know if you played that brilliant game in lockdown. I mean, I used to be a massive fan of things like Monopoly, but that got a little bit boring. You play that with the kids Christmas Day and on occasions, but love the fact that really we can make in, in lockdown, we'd make dinner, try new things, you know, do all that. Then you get a glass of wine, a beer, settle down to a nice game of scraps and, uh, you know, two, three, four of us um, changes the dynamic always. Uh, but yeah, no, um, I, I do need to get that book of those two letter words, you know, right at the end, they can make all the difference right at the end in Scrabble. It's just amazing when you've got to get rid of your tiles and just, you know, make, make some words and get those last little bits of points, you know, that pulls you back in. So it keeps you going right to the end. Nice. Well, a uh, fantastic choice in Scrabble. And I think mine will probably be articulate. But Kaitel, what is your favourite ball game? You guys are making me sound stupid because they're quite intellectual board games that you're playing. I was just going to play like um, Battleships or like Guess Who, like the type of one where you're just like, did I get it? And then when they tell you no, you're just like, all right, I'll just guess again. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I'm appreciating the love for Scrabble. I actually have a, a Scrabble tattoo below my oh, arsenal wow. tattoo. Oh, yeah, so a, a big Scrabble fan here. <laughs> um, otherwise, yeah, let's let's move past um, some board games and onto a little bit of, of football. Um, so yeah, taking it back to the beginning, John. Where did your enthusiasm for the game come from? And what are some of your earliest footballing memories? I know I haven't really, well, we haven't mentioned it yet, but you were born in, in Nigeria. So is that where your footballing story began? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, my dad did his, um, I think did his bachelor's degree in, in America and then came to do his, his master's in England. Met my mum and whisked her off to Nigeria, had five children and then unfortunately died in a car accident. Um, so my mum brought us back in 79. I think I had been about nine, 10 at the time. But obviously, you, I had three brothers and one sister. And, you know, the four, you know, we just used to play football all the time. I used to play with my older brothers and they always used to stick me in goal. And it's funny, I just saw someone send me a picture of I uh, went in goal because I, I ended up, used to, I used to go in goal in training. And I used to mess around if there was myself here, Ryan, Mark Bright and Andy Gray messing around. I go in goal, love going in goal. And funny enough, back when I was playing, you remember there was only three, two, they started off with two, one substitute, two substitute, then three. So it was a big decision to have a goalkeeper on the bench. And funny enough, we had a massive derby against Wimbledon at Sellers Park. Um, crazy game, Vinnie Jones, you know, John Fashion, John Scales, all those kind of guys. Scary as, you know, Laurie Sanchez and all the boys. And um, Nigel Martin got sent off and I had to go in goal most scariest experience of my life. The goal just looked massive. Vinnie, Vinnie Jones and John Fashion, whose elbows were glistening like <laughs> daggers, spears, big, you know, I was like, you know, good old Vinny coming in, you're, you know, and that, that, you know, and that was really scary, but um, just tell you a quick story, you know, so 
there was a massive rivalry, Wimbledon, crazy gang in their height. We are in that little tunnel at Sellers Park. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's quite tight. And uh, our captain was Gareth Southgate and Vinnie Jones was captain in Wimbledon. And I wasn't very far back, but I just, he, he turned to Gareth um, and he just looks at him and goes, Oi, schoolboy, you're getting that, son. <laughs> and I, I promise you, no word of a lie. If you see Gareth now, his nose is still, <laughs> he's still crook. You, you look at it, but 10, 15 minutes into the game, Gareth was getting stretched off. I mean, it was, it was carnage. They were horrible. You know, Vinny would come up to me for the game. Oh, he said, Arco, oh, you're going home in an ambulance. And I, you know, I'd try not to look scared. <laughs> Yikes. He was horrible. He was horrible. But I'm hoping he's going to come to our charity game next week. So um, all will be forgotten. All will be forgiven. Once you cross that line, you got to get on with it. It's big boy, big boy games. Yeah, he's yeah. a wonderful personality of the game. And he's made made his way to Hollywood since. So, yeah, we love yeah. him. So, He's done well, and he was—he was rubbish as well. He, was <laughs> he had a long throw, and he, he could—he—he he could intimidate. But I suppose he was a better footballer than he was given credit for. But he, you know, he was horrible. He was <laughs> You'll always <laughs> have the, the Gascoigne moment, at least. Huh? I was yeah, saying, yeah, always yeah, have, yeah. That photo is—it's yeah. it's a brilliant photo. It was now not, you know, you're not surprised that Vinny ended up in Hollywood, and actually delighted and. Um, you know, he's one of our own out there and he's done, he's done so well because, he, you know, he's played that tough man. And, you know, arguably he was, but, um, you know, Vinny's Vinny grown so much and developed, but, you know, about carving a career for yourself. Uh, for anyone out there, you know, young, aspiring actors, teenage, you know, sports guys, you know, dare to dream and go and make it happen and, um, you know, give it your all and, and you know, just, just be determined and be prepared to work hard and, and believe in yourselves and it's incredible what you can achieve yeah no you're certainly right and you know what a character Vinnie Jones is although I, I don't envy you having played against him that does sound pretty scary but um yeah, that whole side was scary yeah <laughs> no, they, 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 they were good as well Dennis Wise was was the the most horrible but he could play you know John Scales at the back that's some that's some good players as well you know they they did well but they weren't just you know complete thugs but they they were uh, <laughs> they could play as well yeah, well, they certainly could play a bit. Um, but yeah, let's talk about um, Crystal Palace. So um, you got into the first team um, and then got promoted fairly quickly. And then there's obviously, mm. of course, there's the famous FA Cup final against Manchester United. And you, 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 you were part of a team that had a lot of success. So what do you think in those early, early years at Palace? What was so special there um, that sort of made this team gel together and play so well? And... Um, do you have any regret about the fact that you just couldn't quite win that FA Cup final? Obviously, Wright had the amazing game and it looked like you were going to do it, but it didn't quite happen. So, yeah, what was so special about that Palace team? Do you know what was really special? And that's a great question in a sense where Stevie Cobble came. He was a young manager to retire at 28. And he came and he brought in, you know, very experienced uh, number twos like David Kemp, mm -hmm. like I think it was Alan Smith at the time. But what he did was his first job was to, to get rid of the older players. It was a massive transition. And obviously Ron Nodes brought him in and said, look, you go in there and you rip that apart and, and create something new. So what he did was people like Jim Cannon, who's played 600 games at the club, Mickey Droy, Steve Kettridge, Alan Irvine, some, you know, those old guys. Um, that were playing, um, were part of that squad, disappeared. And what he did, he went scouting. And we had a wonderful scouting system at the time. People like Johnny Mack, some great scouts, and God rest his soul, he just left us. Um, you know, when he scouted Dulwich Hamlets, you, you know, you're Sutton Uniteds and, and, you know, working, that is, you know, their magic in, in, in that non-league non market. So we picked up people like Andy Gray, Ian Wright, you know, Mark Bright, who, you know, was in the Midlands, came came down, John Pemberton, Jeff Thomas came down from Crew, Crew Alexander, because, you know, that connection with Dario Grady, obviously, is, a, you know, very famous at producing players like David Platt and, and so many more. Um, and Richard Shaw and I and, and, um, were coming through the, the, the youth system and he just really brought us together and it, it created an, an incredible mix. And, and I don't know if you remember, I, I went off on loan to Swansea and Richard went to Hull. And um, I was on Swan I was at Swansea playing in the Cup Winners' Cup in, in Panathinaikos in the Olympic Stadium in Athens. And I, I came down the day of that game and the lads were all laughing, the Swansea lads, you know, the Chris Commons and the Andy Melvilles and the Andy Legs, you know, were absolutely in, t in, in tears. 
It was going on? I said, oh, Palace lost 9-0 last night at Liverpool. He was like, are you joking? No. I thought they were winding me up, but you looked at the back of the sun and it was like, wow, OK. And, and that was a turning point, you know, and Steve brought me back on from loan, Richard back. We bought Eric Young, uh, Andy Thorne, and we, we bought arguably the best goalkeeper I played with, Nigel Martin, one of the first million pound goalkeeper from Bristol Rovers down in the, in, in the, um, the combine after the country. Uh, we used to, Nigel was brilliant. He was just a threat. So what you did, you had a dressing room full of young, fresh, hungry uh, players looking to carve out careers, looking, to, you know, really looking to make their mark on the game. So it, it, it really came together. And what Stevie Coppell had, he, he never really coached. He didn't really get involved with that. And as I say, he had some good coaching, but he understood the game and he had a great philosophy. But the best thing he did, he could put, round pegs in round holes and square pegs in square holes, which is so important. I know it sounds stupid. So we had, you know, everything was built for right and bright. And, and you know, we had a young lad come from Stafford Rangers called Stan Collymore in the book, who couldn't even get in the team. Um, but what he did, he organised the team so well. We had a very simple philosophy, you know, Andy Gray and Thomas, two touch midfield, get it forward. We knew up, back and through, get it wide to myself and Eddie McGoldrick. Full backs would... Would stay in their sh- in the, in their shape. The back four, you know, sit, you know, one would sit. It was days when you had two number eights. One would sit, one would go. Um, Andy Gray was mostly the guy who sat in front. Absolutely brilliant player. Probably arguably the most talented out of the group. Um, but we we got it up there. So we would we would shut teams off. We would defend. We had to work hard. We had to be disciplined and organised. And you talk about that semi final against Liverpool in you know where we just went man for man. I was marking Ray Houghton. I went wherever he went, you know, in the cup final against Man United, I was marking Brian McClare, um, wherever he went, Shawsy had Danny Wallace, you know, you had, you had your jobs, you had your jo- jobs and roles and, and we, we relied on set pieces. And that semi-final was the, you know, probably if you wanted to look in a dictionary for how to win a game, you know, David Goliath, um, set yourselves up well, make, get, make yourselves hard to beat and, and win your games on your set pieces on, on your strength. So, um, the camaraderie is brilliant. I mean, Wrighty is just funny. He was funny. He was brilliant. But Wrighty was one of those players. He's the best player I work with and, and the most important. And because he would come into training and he'd say, oh, did you see what Ronaldo did? Did you see what, what Zico did or what, what Zidane did? Or do? And we'd, we'd practice those tricks. And he loved and was so enthusiastic about football, so passionate. He, or, or we were, but he got the best out of us. He'd grab Nigel, he'd grab me, he'd say, right, let's go and do, you know, in half an hour of finishing, half an hour of crossing and shooting. And we just all got dragged along with this, with this desire and this enthusiasm and this passion to, 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 to progress and do well and go and, you know, go and make our mark. And, and certainly right, he was, you know, the pinnacle of that. And, and he just grew. He was, he was a diamond. And every time he polished him, he got shinier. <laughs> and, uh, he was lucky enough, funny enough, George Graham came in for me to, to, to take me to Arsenal, uh, but they wouldn't sell me. Unfortunately, I think Graham Soonis came as well at Liverpool. And uh, I do oh, I do look back and think, oh, do you know what? If only, if only. And uh, But look, you know, it was a great squad. Um, they were very mentally strong. They were talented, very driven. And, um, you know, we had Stevie Coppel there, who was the master genius. You know, he was very quiet, never lost his temper, never lost his rag. But really, that side just came together and, and the design, the strength of mind in that squad uh, was the driving force. It's interesting to hear that Arsenal were in for you. I think you, you can probably see the scarves behind me. We would have loved to have you at, at the club. Uh, oh. And um, I, I was fortunate enough to actually see you play in Martin Keown's testimonial. Um, yeah. Game. But uh, otherwise, another sort of random little link that we have is... Um, Joe and I, the school that we went to, uh, an ex-teammate of yours ended up becoming a, a, soccer, a football coach there, John Humphrey. Okay, yeah. Funnily enough. He became uh, deputy head then at Wycliffe School. Um, and he's, yeah, uh, I think, he went on to be a, a principal on, in his own right somewhere. Yeah, so, I mean, that was one of the strangest things because my, my, my boy went to Wycliffe and I oh, yeah. remember when he, was, he, he went to Wycliffe and we had to go to parents' evening and um, John was one of his... Um, teachers <laughs> and I it just I couldn't keep a straight face so I was like you know it was John Humphrey you know sort of all that banter all those years together in the dressing room and on, on the pitch I mean top you know great player great lad he was always very sensible very intelligent and uh you know didn't surprise me at all and obviously look you know back back in those days players earned you know normal money 
and not life-changing money like you do now. You know, it's like they win the lottery every time they sign contracts at 17, 18, let alone at, at 22, 24. So, um, you know, you go on and you progress in life and you move on and you find the next challenge. And, and there's so much more out there to life than um, football, unfortunately, or sports. But, you know, once you're in, you're in. I mean, we absolutely love it. We live and breathe it. And uh, But there is also lots of life out there. And, uh, yeah, Johnny's one of those people that's progressed and gone and done well after his career yeah yeah we uh yeah definitely soft spot for john humphrey but um also interesting to hear you mentioned sort of how steve koppel came in and adopted a bit of a more youthful approach it's it's good to know that's something that's sort of stuck at palace obviously they produced the likes of what routledge moses zaha wan basaka they have an incredible um mm. academy i don't know if it's just their location in london that they're able to pick up so many passionate young kids who are playing playing football but away from i guess some of the we talk, talked about some of the highlights uh, of, of the time at Palace, but after that FA Cup final, you would get injured the following season, I believe, and then mm. um, miss a decent amount of games. And um, by the time you came back the next year, you guys ended up getting relegated from the, the Premier League. You helped them come straight back up, but then you guys again went went down. What was going on at the club when you were yo-yoing? Was it, you know, Mark Bright and Ian Wright got sold? Was it just a lack of quality on the pitch? Were there things going on behind the scenes? Yeah, that was an incredible time, really, because we we finished third in the top flight, the Premier League. Um, and then we won the Zenith State Systems final, beat Everton 3-1. You know, Everton finished ninth that year, we finished third. And you think, you look at that side and you thought that side can really go on to do things. And and funny enough, you know, Ian Wright, I can remember Ian Wright saying, we need to strengthen, we need to buy players. And he went to Ron Nodes and Stevie Coppel and sort of said, well, look, if you bring in two or three or four you know, big names and strengthen this squad, then I'm happy to, to carry on on this journey. But, you know, I'm beginning to hear noises and I'm wanted elsewhere. So, you know, it's Ron Nodes and Stevie Cork. I said, well, we haven't really got the money and we don't really think we need to change too much. Uh, and it was devastating. You know, I can remember the day right he left. It was like it was like the day JFK got shot or remember when someone, you know, hearing that Princess Dyer died and, you know, right leaving Palace was like, oh my God, you know, the world had ended and it, it, it really sort of felt a bit like that. And we'd lost, you know, our talisman, you know, our linchpin. And um, it was just never the same after that. And, you know, that season I went into there, I, I got into the England squad over the summer. I'd gone to Australasia, you know, things were falling into place. I, you know, I had Lazio, no, sorry, Bari wanted to buy me. I was going to sit down and, and talk with them with the, the day after and the, that day at night at Leeds, you know, at Sellers Park when I sort of ruptured my uh, knee, um, that was devastating. But I was out for the rest of the season. So right, he left and then right, he ended up going. I got injured and it just fell apart. We went down. Um, and then obviously, you know, Alan Smith took over again and, and rebuilt with Gareth Southgate, Chris Coleman, Dean Gordon and Chris Armstrong. You know, Chris Armstrong, what a player he was, by the way. He was, um, he was phenomenal. And we, we sort of re, rebuilt the side. We won the ch you know championship as it was then. Came into Premier League, actually scored two. I got to play out front with Chris Armstrong at Highbury and scored my two goals there. You know, uh, and I was like, I should play out front more. But I used to say that to, to Wrighty, you know, because back in those days, it was a big man and a little man. And uh, that was the kind of football it was. And as great a player as Brighty was, as the big man, I used to say to Wrighty, Wrighty, we don't need a big man. We just need two little quick, skillful men, you know. And, and uh, you know, Steve knew better. And he, he talked me into that left side position. But I was a centre forward as a kid. But I loved playing up front whenever I got the chance. But, you know, there were days when, you know, you, you got on with it and you, you played your position, you played your part in the team and, and, and you were disciplined and organised. And that's what it was, you know. And, and they were very greedy and they were very selfish. They wanted to score the goals and, you know, they made it very clear. We score the goals, you provide. And, and, and the kids now, they, they don't do that anymore. Goals make prizes and they, they want to play 4-3-3 and, you know, they play different systems. And you talk about people like Routledge, Moses and Zaha. They don't have to do all the tracking back we did. They don't have to do all the running and the, and the, and the doubling up on your fullback and you're getting back in shape and then getting back up. They didn't have to do that. And that's one of the biggest things Wrighty said to me when he moved to Arsenal. They used to say to him, Wrighty, don't, you don't have to work. You don't have to come back. You just stay out there and score goals. We'll do the rest. And they were that good. And he said he actually loved it and he thrived. And of course, he did what he did best was just go up that end and score score goals. Um, and, you know, he was the top scorer till 
you know, the legend Thierry Henry, my favourite player in the whole world. Love him. Um, he came along and, and, and destroyed it, but obviously had Dennis Bergkamp and people like Vieira to go with him. I'm a bit of a gooner, by the way. You might you might notice an overmars and you know, but um, you know, it, it, it's changed. But you know, we we yo-yoed and then um, we went down again, which was devastating. And I ended up leaving and going to Coventry back in '96. Um, just needed a fresh challenge, needed a new chapter. We did well. I mean, under that Gareth Southgate side, I don't know if you remember, you know, we, we had Ray Houghton come in. Um, Ray Wilkins came in. So we had a bit of experience mixed with that youth. And we ended up getting to the semi-final of both cups. Uh, and unfortunately, talk about, you know, when you watch the draw and you want, we got Liverpool in the League Cup and, and Man United in the FA Cup. And, and the FA Cup actually went against Man United, went to a replay. We drew 2-2 on the, on the Saturday. And I think the replay was on the Thursday where, there'd been a lot of bad blood between Palace and Man United after the Cantona incident. Oh, yeah. He kicked that fan and was playing that night as well. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, ended up one of the Palace fans ended up dying uh, that night. So it was kind of, it was kind of crazy time, but that side got to the seven. And that, that's where, you know, Gareth Southgate ended up playing sweep, centre half. We played a sweeper system and Gareth Southgate played at centre half. And that was the making of him really, because he was a centre mid player. And uh, after that, Gareth ended up moving to Villa to play with Ekiog and um, McGrath. <laughs> oh, terrible, huh? And uh, yeah, I ended up carving a fantastic career, uh, going on to Middlesbrough and then England and um, obviously getting sort of 57 caps. And now he's uh, manager of England, bless him. Yeah, he's done well for himself, Gareth. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a few of those squads as well. Yeah. No, you you were part of some historic teams. Every every name you're mentioning, you know, Ray Ray Wilkins, rest in like all these guys are legends. Yeah, Chris Coleman, you know, the guys who played with they they've all gone. You know, there's a lot of those. You know, a lot of it was a tough dressing room. It was a tough squad. It was a you know, say talented players, but very strong characters. You know, Ray Houghton brought you know something. You know, one of the guys I played with, Paul Stewart, for a while, and. Um, you know, it's funny when you look at characters in a dress room and the way they behave, and then suddenly things come out that you realise there's a lot more goes on in life than, um, you know, crazy, crazy, but, you know, great times. And, um, you know, going back to, to, to um, you know, the early times, Stevie Koppel, you know, what he did was Alan Smith had a connection with Wimbledon and he was his assistant. So we, we had that crazy game connection where Wally Downs came as coach, tremendous coach, but he brought a mentality and a... And, a, you know, philosophy to the club where, you know, the banter and, and, the, and the, you know, the training and, and, and really what went on there, the mental strength. Because I can remember Stan Collymore coming as a young lad, all full of himself. And, you know, he got knocked down. You were knocked down as, as a kid, you know. You know, that was when you, arguably you could say, well, it was, you know, bullying, you'd call it. Um, you know, whatever it was, it was a, it was a tough environment. But you learned to win, and you learned your position. You learned to fight for your place, and it was it was, it was dog eat dog. And that's what people perhaps don't quite realise is that you're all you're all individuals playing in a team game, and you need to get your position, you need to get your place, you need to keep it, you need to do what you've got to do to do that. And um, you know that's often very tough because everyone is 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 tough and selfish and ruthless and. You know, everyone wants to do well for themselves and trying to pull that into a team, team, uh, you know, to pull together is, is not easy. Um, you see it nowadays, you know, people are very selfish, you know, you'd see Arsenal, if you get all Oses and Shackers and people doing their own thing, it, you know, the hardest thing Arteta's got there is to pull that team together. You know, whether you're Guardiola and you, if, you, if you don't have Aguero on your side, Jesus or Sane and, you know, you don't, you, you need your companies, you need your Fernandinho's, you need your, your proper team players, your captains who can, boss that training ground, boss that dressing room and keep the lads together. So, you know, I see, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of selfishness out there right now. Sorry, what was the question? No, no, you, you definitely, <laughs> you've answered it. I was going to say, um, it sounds like an absolute sink or swim dressing room that you're in and inevitably you, you swam all the way into the England team eventually, but sticking on, um, sticking on your club career, but post, post palace, but, uh, there might be a bit of a Pet Palace connection to come up. Um, you played for, yeah, essentially a ton of, well, not a ton, a bunch of historically big and successful clubs. I think Brent Brentford, where you finish your career, is the only team that you played for that actually has never been in the Premier League. Um, but Reading, right. um, and I hope that I don't catch any flack from any of the fans of the other teams that you've played for, I'd say Reading maybe is arguably the club 
besides Palace that your career is most well, synonymous with? Um, I kind of went, I, I was going to move to Newcastle with Kevin Keegan and it, it was really weird, a, a quick story. Just, so I ended up out there and it turned out Kevin was trying to, they'd been trying to sign David Ginola and it made you laugh because I think David Ginola at the time was demanding 25, 30 grand a week. And then, you know, the highest player was on Barnes on 10 grand a week. And they were like, you're not going to get that. So Kevin kind of got me up there and I got caught up in a little bit of game of chess and I'm like, can't you sign both of us? You know, I'd love, and, and anyway, cut a long story short, they ended up signing David Ginola. It was, it was sort of the beginning of the end for Kevin anyway. Um, there was a lot of a lot of uh, you know politics going on in the background, and that was a real shame. And I ended up signing for Ron Atkinson at Coventry, and and you know that was a that was a lovely time because you had people like Unlove, you don't know if you remember Noel Whelan, Darren Huckabee, Gary McAllister came. Um, <clears throat> again, Richard Shaw ended up coming with me. Burrows, Grizovich, you know, we we had we had a tremendous team. Dion Dublin. Um, and, you know, we survived the three years we were there. But for Coventry, you know, Highfield Row was a great place to play. A great set of fans. Enjoyed the time up there. Then I ended up going to Fulham with Kevin. Finally linked up with Kevin Keegan. Um, and again, you know, start of Mohamed al Fayed's, you know, building Fulham. Paul Bracewell was there. B Peter Beersley came. You know, Rufus Brevet. And we, you know, we, we had a, a tremendous team. Um, and, di and did really well. And that team was always going to go up and they had the money. And, uh, you know, I ended up leaving and going to Charm with Kerbishley and then ended up playing people like Scotty Parker, Koncheski, Richard Rufus, you know, um, Graham Stewart and, and, and some wonderful players, Sean Barley up front and, and Hunt, Andy Hunt, who's tremendous. Um, and we got promoted. We won, the, we won the championship and came in and finished eighth in the, in the Premier League. Wasn't getting enough games um, time, so I ended up going with Pardew to Reading. Um, at the time, he, he's number two was Martin Allen, and again, you know, Sir John Medeski was on a mission to try and to try and go on, and you know, you saw Kevin Doyle's um, and Andy um, Noel Hunt, and you know, who was there? Sid Well in midfield with Parkinson and, and people like that, Ibrahimi Sonko and, you know, Graham Murty right and Nicky Shorey left back. And, and that was another fantastic dress room. But I loved my time at Reading and that was really quite special. Lovely family club. Uh, we built something, Jamie Curiton and Martin Butler up front, you know, Jamie, oh, Nicky Forster. Um, great dress room. I, I love that dress room. Um, that was a very, that was a very nice special time. And I still enjoy going back, uh, obviously, to Fulham. But Reading, it's always, always special to go back there. And it's great to see them doing so well. And I know they started really well this year, dropping off. But it'd be, it'd be wonderful to see them bounce back into the Prem. Oh. And then, I'm oh, sorry, I missed out my last year with my, Matt, Martin Allen, Mad Dog at, at Brentford. That was a... That was a <laughs> Sticking on Reading, you'd mentioned um, Steve Koppel being reunited. You mentioned um, Alan Pardew as well, you know, an ex-teammate and an ex-manager that you ended up playing for over there. Did you find that, given that that's quite a unique dynamic, I guess, to play for an ex-teammate and, you know, the same ex-manager, did that put more pressure on you to sort of not let your mates down? Or were you, did they give you a bit more leeway because you guys knew each other so personally for so long? Yeah, it was interesting with with, with Alan Potts um, because he came at time and I was playing in the Premier League and, you know, what he could offer me was less than what I was on and I wasn't really prepared to go down. So I went there on loan and it's actually, an interesting, you know, it's a funny story because, you know, sort of parts pulled me and he, he said, Oh, look, we want you to come to Reading on loan. And I was thinking, Oh, well, to look, I'm playing in the Premier League. You're in league one. Um, Curves will probably not let me go anyway. Do you know what? We're doing really well and it, it's, it's all going very well. So I went in and we just played a, a reserve game at, at um, at the Valley and Curbs was there and he was still there. So I went back in and I said, oh, you know, Gaffer, can I have a word? And I said, oh, look, Reading are interested in me coming on loan and thinking Curbs would go, no, don't be stupid. You're not going anywhere on loan. You, you, you're a valuable part of my squad. And he just turned around to me and went, yeah, brilliant. No, go. Yeah, yeah, go and, go and get some games. And I was like, I was just stunned. I was like, okay, right then. So went back outside and said, yeah, let's have a chat tomorrow. And then, you know, I was off my way into rest. How ruthless and cutthroat it was. It was like, oh, OK, well, OK, well. Uh, right. So, um, yeah, jog on, Sal. So, um, yeah. But it worked out. On. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you know, you've got to make it work. And in my own mind, it was it was time for me to play games anyway. And, um, you know, I went there and really enjoyed it. Great stadium, so great bunch of boys. And, um, 
you know, League One, we, we, we came second to Brighton that year. Uh, you know, Bobby Zamora was, was scoring stupid amounts of goals at Brighton. They finished top. Uh, so we went up and we went into the championship and we held our own and did well. And it just, you know, it was it, it was just a, it was an ongoing, you know, upward trajectory for, for Reading at the time as, as, it, as it was when I was at Fulham, you know, and I was, you know, it was a good time to be part of that. Um, so, so, you know, very proud and to, be, to have been part of that and be part of that special journey taking it forward. Brilliant. Well, you know, potentially Brentford and Reading could go up. So what a great year that would be for you if that happened. But um, very quickly, just on your um, post um, playing career, you obviously um, have coached at Palace, both the youth levels and at the first team level. And actually, it's appropriate in the background, I can see it looks like um, soccer specials on. But you've, of course, we've watched you a lot on um, soccer special as well when you've been reporting your matches. So out of punditry and coaching, is there one that you prefer or do you like both aspects of those two things you've kind of done post-career? Yeah, that's a great question. Is in a sense where when I got injured uh, at 22, um, I started doing my coaching badges. I did my, my coaching badge at the time and, and I started doing television. So, you know, you start thinking about life after football, you know, sort of being told you might not play again, you might not work out. So you've got to think about what you're going to do. So, and you've got to keep yourself occupied. So I started doing both and I really enjoyed both. And I was very lucky in a sense where, um, you know, the, the guys at Sky, David White, who was head of Sky and Andy Melvin were fantastic. And they said, look, if the career doesn't work out, we'd love to have you here. It'd be great to have you on board. And, you know, Sky started in 19... 19- to you know, that merging of B Sky B and Sky, and it was the beginning of. I remember when you know it was the beginning of cheerleaders, and we had the bright jackets, and you had the razzmatazz and the fireworks, and that that was, you know, that's where football changed. You know, it, it, that's where the money came in, and it just Sky just revolutionised um, the way we watched, we the way football was covered, the way we we looked at it, and. It, it's never been the same, and it's just grown year on year. And you know, Scudamore just left, you know, took it from a, you know, from from a one billion pound industry to what it is now I think it's a five six billion pound industry that that is the best you know it's our biggest export in this country worldwide you know it's just a phenomenon people love it and and Sky have been right at the heart of that and and you know I was there with Andy Gray Richard Keys and I was presenting goals on Sunday with Anna Walker and you know it was it was it was an incredible but I wanted to play and I went back to playing. And then when I came out, I remember ringing, ringing Andy Melvin, just saying, look, I've had enough of these youngsters. I'm taking anti-inflams to train. You know, you, you, these kids are too strong. You know, I'm going to places like Chesterfield on a Saturday and getting absolute dog's abuse. <laughs> I am just, you know, I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. So I rang Sky and got on board with, and, and I ended up, you know, with Jeff Stelling on, on Soccer Saturday with the boys. And, you know, that, that was a great experience. But, you know, I, at the same time, I was sort of converting my old coaching badge to my UEFA A, that turned into a B, you have to go and, you know, so I'm sat at my UEFA A course with Sam Allardyce, you know, with some of the great players, Graham Souness, Gordon Strack, and um, God, the list is endless. And, you know, I was quite amazed that they didn't, you know, we, we hadn't taken it that seriously and made it, you know, a must to have all your coaching badges, where I think Spain, France, Italy, Germany, you do have to have your badges to work. Um, so having done both and then obviously having the opportunity, you know, I applied for a lot of jobs um, uh, over the years and I, d- I didn't get one interview. I didn't get one one interview, um, which I was quite disappointed about. And over the years, just got a little bit demoralised with it and, and started losing sort of my desire and passion to do that. And, you know, Sky were brilliant and I was do- doing Sky, getting involved with, with, you know, real life, as I call it, you know, business and, and different things and and then finally you know i started doing the, the under 13s at palace then did the other 16s and and pods came to me and said do you, you know you want to come on board with the first team you know, on the first team coach and i did that that 15 16 season which was an incredible learning curve i mean it was just i mean i'd been out of the dressing room for god 10 12 years and it was a changed environment it was so different and you had to learn and i didn't coach day in day out and um you know sort of knowing keith millen was brilliant work with him and, and pods and it, it was a magical you know we we, we struggled we, we were fifth I think going into Christmas and then after Christmas we couldn't win a league game we were winning cup games so we ended up luckily we, we survived and we got to the cup final against Man United which was Van Gaal's last game um, 
and we I just thought the writing was on you know I thought it was destined for us to get revenge for that 1990 loss um and you know master plan was working punch and score the 74th minute you know and then of course Paz does that jig which I blame him for and and then they they score two goals <clears throat> and win it. It's just devastating, devastating. But it, the experience of being Watford in the semi-finals and being part of that with the Palace fans was just so magical in the final. Um, so you know, both wonderful. But talking about the ruthless and cutthroatness of the game, you know, Paz called me in the summer. I thought we were you were looking to have, you know, he was going to tell me which games I was scouting for the European Championships, what players were interested, what we'd done, you know, what we needed to do better, what we did wrong. You know, just looking to, you know, really pumped and looking to go into that second season. And, you know, he called me to a breakfast meeting and said, look, um, you know, I, I've got different plans. I'm going to shake things up. It leaves you out of the in the cold a little bit, but I'm sure there's a role for you somewhere else. And, and the talks didn't go that well. And I ended up leaving, you know, very demoralised and very downhearted that, you know, the way it worked out with my own club, really, with the club I'd grown up with and, and, and spent so much time. But... It's just the way the game is. It's it's ruthless. It's it's a it's a juggernaut that's moving, and everyone's under pressure. Everyone's got to make decisions. And everyone's got to win games. Um, so came out and you know back into punditry and back into the TV. And I absolutely love love the punditry side. It, it's the it's the next best thing. And you know it's great. You can enjoy it. You embrace all the fans. You go to the different grounds, even if they are singing. You're just a Chris Kamara. <laughs> <laughs> that always made me laugh. I just, you know, you get tremendous stick at Brighton, obviously, you know, but that, it was all in good, good humour. You know, you go to places like Millwall <clears throat> and uh, round, round the, you know, teams that fans that remember you, you know, for your Palace days. But you know, ninety nine percent of the clubs were absolutely fantastic. You know, loved going up to Everton, Liverpool, and all the big clubs. It, it, it was just wonderful. You know, travelling up there, seeing the fans, and covering the game was was fantastic. And obviously Jeff's made Gillette soccer into just something so magical and wonderful. And, and it was like a family working with all those guys, you know, sort of legends of the game. And they're all great, great guys and, and, a, and a brilliant company to work for. And as I say, you know, again, part of that revolution of what Sky have made, made the Premier League. So you, I can't say I'd love to coach. I mean, it's in your blood, but I always describe it as football is, is an incredibly gorgeous uh, voluptuous woman that I just love, but she treats me badly. I must let her go. I've got to let her go. I've got to get. I need to find myself just a nice girl that you know that treats me well. Yeah, sometimes I guess knowing when to to call it quits is is, is the hardest thing. But um, it's never, it's never gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that that leads. I was gonna I was gonna push you a little further. Yeah. Have since um, Hodgson's been in 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 sort of at the wheel at Palace, have you had any discussions? Not necessarily with him personally, but with the club about returning even at the, uh, back in like the youth level at where you're doing the under 16s? Yeah, no, not really. Um, and again, it's, it's just the way, the way it works. You know, I know that um, Richard Shaw, who I worked with was doing the under 18s. He was doing the under 23s um, with Ray, Dave, David Redders. And he's up coaching with the first team now. I know that, uh, uh, you know, Dougie Friedman's come in as, um, director of football, Brighty still look, looking after the, the, the loan signings and the youth development. Paddy McCarthy's looking after the under 18s and, you know, um, you know, there's, there's various guys. So everyone brings in who, who they like, who they know, who they want to work with. And, you know, there's so many names. It, it's, it's a very crowded room and it's a crowded place. Everyone's clamoring for those jobs and they're so hard to get hold of and so hard to keep hold of. So, you know, it, in a way, you know, when I came out, I just thought, you know what, that's something I've got to leave alone. I've got to stop calling that girl. <laughs> I've just got, <laughs> got to, got to, got to move on. And, and yeah, I mean, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to be involved. Just love it. And it's in your blood. It's something that's very, um, something you just can't change. Um, and it, it, you know, we all know it. You, you, you know it as fans, and we all miss it desperately because we can't watch it. And it isn't the same game that we love and that we that we know. Hopefully we'll come back and we'll be back with full stadia very soon and, and the game back as we know it. So it's that camaraderie. You know, of course, there is that tribalism that goes with football. That's, that's and, and, and all the different stories, you know, VAR coming out, you know, the Black Lives movements, the different 
things that have come out of this year, you know, just been an incredibly historic year when it 2021 of, of what's happened, the world stopping, sports stopping, you know, everything that's changed. But, you know, what you desperately hope is that we've all learned so much, we've all changed and we're all going to be better people, you know, going into 2022. Yeah, I guess the only constant is that Arsenal are just not not very good these days. <laughs> oh, do you know what? High hopes won the you know won the community you know the, the community won the FA Cup, and you're thinking right, Arteta's the man, but you know just Arsenal have never invested at the right time, never never really shored up that spine, and never replaced the Galacticos. Um, you know, just just you know, I thought Lino was going to be a superstar in goal. He's not proven to be. You know. Yeah, he's no young what you hoped for, but he can get better. He's only a young lad. And uh, Torreira, you were hoping would shore up that in front of the defence and just not enough creativity in the centre mid. And, you know, unfortunately, Obama Yang is there, but, you know, there's not enough fight. Lacazette's okay. You know, you look around, Shaka and El Nenny and, you know, Metzo's always been a massive disappointment. And he's been a cancer in the, in the squad, really, to be honest. And, uh, you know, it's just been difficult. You know, you, you sign people like David Luiz and come on. Come on, yeah, eight million. Like, you know, I go and play the center. Right? You're like, oh, where are you going? But look, there's lots of good signings happening. There is beginning to be a nucleus. So Arteta needs time, and I think Arteta, in the long run, what he's learned under Pep, and he's very organised, very you know, very focused, and um, I think tactically he's very astute as well. Very strong man, but he just needs time. He needs some serious backing now, and it's it's going to take a little bit of time. And and everyone's just bounced on. You know, your Wolves, your Leicester's. Um, there's a lot of strong side, even Everton uh, strong now. So, you know, you look outside that that top six. It's you know, Man United should really bounce back in there. Man City going to bounce back in there. It's only going to be Arsenal that are going to be drifting. But I think to say they're going to be in any shape or form involved in a, in, a, in a relegation battle is just stupid. <laughs> You're fine. We'll see, I guess. I, I mean, I hope they are. As you, like you've probably seen my Spurs behind me, but I'll just take Tottenham winning the league. Don't have to worry about. Can, can, do you think you can win it this year? I'm starting to believe more, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. Saying, I'm trying to trying to stay calm, but yeah, obviously we've got Palace on the weekend, so hopefully we'll oh. be and then um and then the big game is Liverpool at Anfield. I mean if we get a win at Anfield, then I will definitely um be believing, but I'm quietly confident, I think I'd say. Do you know what it's brilliant to see Spurs back up there and firing? I, I went a couple of times to that stadium and wow, wow. You know, I was a bit of a goon in myself. I thought the Emirates was the best stadium in, in the world. But uh, all right, the Alliance Arena might have something to say. But the Emirates, but the the, the, the new Spurs Stadium is just taking it to a to a ridiculous level. It's just yeah. outstanding. It's just so good. Um, and, and again, it's it's taking football just to a, a to an outrageous level of what you what you want to come as a fan from all over the world to watch football. It's and that that hopefully is the future. We can see more of that. And I think whenever anyone talks about foreign money coming in and, and different um, benefactors coming in to help the English game. I, I, I just think it, it can only be good for the game. And the only disappointment right now is I'd love to see people like Ronaldo still here, people like Suarez, people like Messi, mm. Jamie if he'd come to Man City and just attract some of the, the great, great top players. You know, we just, we've lost a lot of, a lot of the top, top end players. Uh, it's great to see Bell back. Um, but what Spurs are doing is, is is exceptional. You know, I love Jose. He lost he lost the plot for a while. Got a little bit miserable, um, but hopefully he's back. He's got his mojo back and the special I one. I think there's another championship in the, in the special one. Hopefully, it will be this season or next season with Spurs. Oh, I'd love that. Love that I, I'm just looking forward to hopefully us beating Dundalk tomorrow. That's about as much as I can hope for. Yeah. Anyway, I guess that probably yeah is a decent place for us to to leave it for today. Um, I want to say. Uh, you know, big thanks to my co-host Joe, and then a uh, very special thank you to John Salako. Um, John, yeah, John, as my dog interrupts us right now, oh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, it's real. yeah, maybe, maybe I'll. Uh, I was gonna say maybe I'll mute it and let let Joe um, wrap it. Actually, I'm just gonna pick him up and bring him over. Oh, look at that! Yeah, just. Yeah, but just... it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Enjoyed it, and um, you know. I know it'll go well and good luck with it for the rest of the season. I'm going to tip a battle between Spurs, Man City and uh, Liverpool for the title. I think Liverpool still just might have too much if they can get Van Dijk back, but maybe not. But they still look strong and the mentality is good there. I think Pep's still got a few issues. I think the defence for Spurs might 
just be what lets you down in the end. But I'd love to see Spurs win it. Trust me, I'd love to see Spurs. It'd be brilliant. I'd love to see different people win it and Spurs winning it would um, would be special. Well, it would be very special, John. <laughs> Well, for, for Joe, I suppose, yeah, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of hoping for anything but Spurs, I'll, I'll take. But um, yeah, just before we let you jump so, off, John, um, how can our listeners follow you? And um, do you have anything sort of coming up in the end of 2020 or beginning of the new year that they can look forward to? Yeah, I'm, I've been doing a lot of work for a very special um, group called My Club Group. Um, so, I mean, if people want to go to myclubgroup.co.uk, sort of working with grassroots clubs, helping them gain grants, helping them to be more sustainable... And, you know, the mantra is survive and thrive. So we're finding ways of keeping grassroots sports clubs alive and helping them go forward and hope that not too many of them go out of business. We're trying to arrange, um, we are arranging the first COVID safe football game um, at Chelmsford City on the 20th of December. And we've got Sam Allardyce managing the My Club group side and Harry Redknapp. And it's all for Mask Our Heroes, uh, which is a fantastic charity. They do a lot of work, PPE, a lot of work with the NHS and with the British Art Foundation. Fabulous. They've got some wonderful ambassadors like Rio Ferdinand, Anton Ferdinand, Callum Best um, and um, Jimmy Bullard. We're hoping they're going to play in the game, which I think they should be. We've got some great names playing on our side. But if people want to go, it's going to be streamed live on social media. So if people want to go to myclubgroup.co.uk, have a look if they want to pay, you know, I think it's Fiverr and you can do, you know, a lot of it will go to Mask Our Heroes. Um, so it's going to be a lovely event, but it's actually the most important thing is trying to get fans back into sport, back to football, back into theatres safely. So it's going to be the first COVID safe football game out there. And it's hopefully going to be the template for getting fans back into sport and theatres safely going forward in 2022. Yeah, hoping that goes off without a hitch. It would be great if that could be yeah, sort of setting a new benchmark for yeah. the standards of how to how to bring people back into stadiums safely and, and, and enjoy themselves. Um, so yeah, thanks Absolutely. again, John. Um, listeners, uh, if you enjoyed that and if you'd like to hear more of our interviews and episodes, please do follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at United Mates FP. And then everything is also available on YouTube in video form. Just search for the United Mates Football Podcast. Until next time, everyone, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Goodbye.